Good morning, good morning, and welcome everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Lovely to see all your faces today. And I'm going to read from Galatians 6, 9. We will reap a good harvest if we don't grow weary of doing good works. Galatians 6, 9. Thank you, Lord, that we can gather together here and praise you and thank you and Remember that you are always watching over us, no matter what, and you will provide. And this is the time of year of the harvest, and we truly appreciate this wonderful world you created for us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, we're going to start with 302, Lamb of God. Please stand and join us this morning as we sing page 302. And as you know, uh, our computer people are gone today, so welcome via Beatty Baptist Church on my Facebook account, uh, but otherwise, we'll get it updated. Your only son knows since you hide, but you have Tribute, and they don't have all the verses going. We're just singing the chorus. 
but it's on page 54. Only if I can find 54.
and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter. And if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. Amen. And let's try that Peter again. Second Peter chapter one. Ah, ah, ah to chapter two. Oh, All yeah. right, verse five. For this very reason, I make every effort to you to add your faith, goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self control, and to self control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measures, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That sounds Makes a much difference. <laughs> much better sound. <laughs> All right. Our next song is found on page 572. And if you'd like to stand, you sure can. 572.
up at their house. So if you like to join together and just some fellowship and some food, Wanda's always making really good food. So at this time, we have prayer and praise. Anything we'd like to praise God for or pray for? Angelica? Angelique? Sorry, wrong name. I want to pray for, um, I want to um, thank God that um, he made this world for all of us and that people can come into other people's lives and help and save them. Amen. Good job. Amen. Chris? <coughs> yeah, sick family. <sighs> Poor family. Uh. Be praying for the Beachams. Once one gets it, they all get it. Oh, yeah. Pass it around, huh? Yeah. I want to Bonnie? thank everybody for the prayers. Uh, the second attempt to take care of my brother-in-law's fully change went very well. They gave him a pain pill and a tranquilizer, and he was in heaven. Didn't feel a thing. <laughs> so next time, hopefully, it, it won't be that as well. Fear. Yeah. Yep. Elaine? Well, it fills my heart with joy to see Clint and Melody and their three boys here. Amen. If you guys didn't know it, Clint's pretty handy at fixing things. <laughs> also, I worry about the red, um, what do you call it? Somebody was sleeping in it, but I don't know who it was. And I went over there when I was watering, and because I thought maybe he was wrapped up or she was wrapped up in it, but it's empty. But the sleeping bag, do you know anything about the red sleeping bag, Pat? Absolutely not. For those of you in video land, we have a red sleeping bag outside of our church window. Is it for sale? <laughs> if you'd like to, you can take it home, Jerry. <laughs> uh, Chris? Baby Dave. Yeah, I've got a baby day praise. Um, it was really long, wasn't it, Andrew? <laughs> it was a really long, long weekend. But what was really cool is uh, the senior center hosted breakfast. We ran out of food, which was really cool. But um, anyway, what was really neat was there is a couple that normally do not do shows like vendors and that kind of stuff on Sunday because they go to church. And they were basically told that they had to stay, otherwise they could never come back. And so they were really asking God. And that morning I put up the sign that we were going to have church following breakfast. And their booth was right next door to breakfast. And they were so excited. They joined us for church. And to make a short story longer, <laughs> the gentleman used to pastor here before Chris's came. Oh, my goodness. The gentleman who it was used to pastor here before Chris's came. He was down from Perum. So and they're currently living in Vegas. But I just want to let you guys know, God even cares about something that minute that they would be put, their booth, right next door to where church was going to happen. And we had such a great fellowship. So <clears throat> I'm going to get all Jerry. That's just really cool. Anything else? David's home and he's doing a lot better. And he's up and around. Oh my. He's had a roller coaster. Yeah, all of them have. Continue to pray for Jerry's family and David. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I don't know if many of you knew, but Mike, where it says in our bulletin, it says Mike traveling bike. <laughs> <laughs> we we just want to let you know Mike is back, but he's going to stay on there because he's still traveling with the bike. So. <laughs> so we're glad to have you back, Mike. Thanks. I did similarly go anywhere. My RV, I'm, I'm, I'm at the RV park and everything. So I just went to a bike race last weekend. Yeah, I know, but this was when you were gone oh, okay. way before. I just didn't take you off. Cause oh, oh, because the rest <coughs> If you notice, we're in pencil ship. Yeah. My printer died. So, again, it has a paper jam, and I can't find the paper jam. Let's go before our Savior, because he cares more. Oh, Carol, go ahead. 
Um, I want to pray for our friend uh, here in Beatty. She's a great grandma, and her great grandson was born in, on July 31st, and he's he weighed only a pound. He now is out of the hospital, but she's taking care of him. And uh, I want to pray for this little guy. I can't pronounce his name. I just know there's a Z in it. <laughs> but anyway, pray for her. And he's on oxygen, and she has some, he has some special feeding needs. He does weigh five pounds now. Oh, that's great. But uh, is that the young man he's special taking care of? Hmm? He's taking care of. Who's yeah? Deanna. Deanna. Okay. All right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for everything that you've created for us and for people that we can interact with. And, and I thank you too for Angelique just coming and joining us. And uh, Lord, you are so gracious. Father, I just pray for the Beach and Kids and for Stephanie and her toes. And Lord, I just thank you so much that you care for us in every situation. Continue, too, to be with Bonnie as she ministers to Jesse and the rest of her family. And, and uh, Lord, you just are so gracious to us. Father, I just praise you for bringing David home safely. And uh, I pray for Deanne as she's taking care of this little baby. Uh, just give her the, the strength because it's a long haul. And just help us here in town to be able to step in and help her out if needed. Father, we just thank you so much for our school and our kids and just all the people that are on our list. I pray again for Karen and Bill. Just continue to protect them. And, and uh, I thank you for our volunteer EMS people or ETM people and fire department you know, and for all the people who put time in with baby days. Um, Lord, you are so gracious to us. And I thank you for who you are. In Jesus' most holy name. Amen. I'm going to need your help, Miss Angelique, because you are the only young person here. Are you able to come help me? Melody's. Melody's young man, if you would like to come up. Oscar, you might want to come up and help me. Yeah, come on. Come on. It's science. Come on. It's science. Come on. It's science. I had the wrong reference here. I'm going to have you move on this side. I had the wrong reference. It is 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 through 9. But we've been talking about what Jesus said he was. And sometimes what happens, Jesus says things, but we don't live them. So Peter kind of helped us out. Ready, young lady? You're going to be my holder. Here we go. So Peter says, to your faith... Add to your faith. You ready? You're going to have to lift us a little bit higher. He says, add goodness. Wait, wait, wait for me. Then, for your goodness, he says to add knowledge. Then, for knowledge, he says to add self-control. What does he say next to add? Perseverance. After perseverance is godliness. After godliness is kindness. And the last is love. Now here's your job. You know what? This is good old science. I need you to come here and I need you to open the lid and give me the lid. And you need to make it so people can see over here in front of the camera. camera. The, cam the TV is the camera. All right. Now, you know what? Angelique, you get to hold this now. You need to have to hold it over. There you go. Now, it says to add those things. Now, when we add those things, you ready? It is so important for us to realize we can add just a little. And there's a little reaction. But when I add all those things, oh. we overflow with God's love. So when Peter chapter 1 tells us to make sure that we add to our faith,
faith, think about that very easy thing because it overflows. The last one is love. Overflow with love. Yes. Thank you, my assistant sisters. It smells like glue. It's it does not smell like glue. It smells like glue. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, I thought that was interesting because so often we get this really nice, long, pretty list, and the end product is God wants to fill our lives to overflow. Our next song is The Greatest Thing in All My Life, page 644. And please stand. The greatest thing. Somebody asked Jesus, uh, amen, it says, ask Jesus. So in Matthew 19, 16, just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? 
Why do you ask me about what is good, Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. I thought that was an odd question that the man asked. Not, what must I do to get eternal life, because a lot of people want to know that. But when he said, which ones? Jesus said, if you want to enter life, keep the commandments, and the man's, man answers, what ones? Because he's looking for the minimum that he can do, right? He's like, which ones do I absolutely have to keep in order to get to heaven? It's interesting, too, that um, you'll see throughout here, eternal life and the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are all used interchangeably, and all three of them mean three different things at different times. So the general idea is this man is asking what he has to do to get to heaven. And um, I believe later on, uh, you'll see Jesus refer to this as entering the kingdom of heaven. But then you'll also see that when Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven, a lot of times he's talking about something on earth. Um, but Jesus uh, gave him a list of, of uh, well, at least one of them is, is you can't keep. I don't believe anybody loves their neighbor as themselves all the time. But this man replies in verse 20, all these I have kept. The young man said, what do I still lack? This is another interesting question, right? Because a lot of times you hear people talk about this passage and they say, this guy was lying. Well, he probably was. I mean, I don't think he kept all, all of the commandments. But he may have thought that he did. He may honestly have thought that he kept those commandments, but he still knows that something is lacking and that he's holding something back. And Jesus knew it too, and he knew what it was. And so he tells him. In verse 21, Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now in our culture, we all hate rich people, right? <laughs> why do they why do they have what I don't have just because they probably work harder than I do um, or whatever Envy. yeah but in uh, I think the way the disciples saw it and I think the way their culture would have seen it is a rich person has everything that they need um, maybe they felt like a lot of us feel that a lot of crime is caused by people not having enough so they have to go out and get it and sometimes that leads to breaking the commandment against stealing. Um, so if this rich person who has all that they need can't get into the kingdom of heaven, or get into heaven, then what hope do poor people have? That's more the perspective that they saw it, like in verse 25. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly <coughs> astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So it seems like the way they understood it, Jesus' point was not that rich people can't enter the kingdom of heaven, but that nobody can enter the kingdom of heaven. So... <laughs> that's exactly what they're Sorry. saying. No, that's okay. Um... Okay, so, why can't we keep the law? Uh, it could be frustrating if you try. I think, I think I've said before, I think I actually was quoting probably somebody along the lines of J. Vernon McGee or somebody like that. When I said, just try to, try to be good for a day. Try to not think a negative thought about anyone. Try to not, um, you know, I mean, whatever. I don't know what your, your problems are. That's one of mine. Lie. Um, driving down the highway and they're trying to kill you. Driving down the highway and, yeah, swearing at other drivers in your mind. Um, or speeding a little bit because everyone else is. 
Uh, the reason that we can't keep it, the law, I think, is uh, that rebellion against authority is in our DNA, so to speak. In Romans 5.18, um, well, Romans 5.18 says that one trespass resulted in the condemnation for, in, in condemnation for all people. So when Adam sinned, that's where our original sin comes from. His children all have that in them, the inability to please God and the inability to obey him. Even in those, those simple things that that rich rule, young ruler felt like he had done. Um, but we were talking about um, people reading the Bible as a buffet and and uh, one thing that everyone knows, who knows anything about Scripture, is that since Jesus came, we're not under the law. And the law is gone. We don't have to worry about that anymore. And I'm being legalistic by saying any, anything like that. Unfortunately, in Jesus' most famous sermon, which is called the Sermon on the Mount, and it's found in Matthew 5 and 6 and possibly 7, um... In verse 17, Jesus kind of touched on that. I was originally going to do my devotional on Matthew 5, and then it just turned into this thing that you see before you here. Uh, so verse 17, so Jesus says, abolish the law or the prophets. He says, uh, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything, excuse me, until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. I think that verse 20 is the key verse to this whole study. I didn't, I, uh, Bonnie asked me what, what I wanted for the um, scripture, but I, I didn't want that because, um, because that raises a question. Because the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were the apparently spiritually rich. So Jesus is, is telling his disciples that they need to be more righteous than these people who do nothing all day except study the law and teach it. And the Pharisees, who were the ones that we can more or less thank for, well, I mean, that, that they're descended from the people who turned God's ten perfect laws into 600 and some odd hmm. rules that they had to live by. Worse yet, I think for our um, non-legalistic brethren is that in the same sermon, Jesus gives us another, more perfect way to interpret the law. And right after that, in verse 21, he says, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Raka, which I'm probably pronouncing wrong, means worthless. So calling someone worthless um, puts a person in danger, in, uh, subject to judgment, or answerable to the court, I guess, in that specific legal sense. And Jesus taught that everyone had value because everyone was made in the image of God. In verse 27, skipping down about <coughs> five verses, um, he goes into, into another. He gives several different examples of how the law now should be read versus how the Pharisees and teachers of the law were reading it. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So then that leads to the question of how can our righteousness surpass these people? And if, you know, sometime it would be interesting. I had thought about doing a little bit of a study on the way that these 
Pharisees and teachers of the law lived in the in the you know the number of tassels on their robes had to be the right number, and they walked around literally you know with scripture on their foreheads, and they I mean there was so many that you know I I actually had examples in here of them being really legalistic, and an example is when the disciples were walking down the road and they were hungry and it was on the Sabbath and they picked the heads of grain that were sticking out of the fields which was all okay to do, except that not only were they not supposed to be doing work, like eating or picking, picking their food, but there was a limit to how far they could travel on the Sabbath. They had come up with these exact values that you could measure yourself by. And then Jesus goes, comes along and says that it's really what's in your heart. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That was Jesus talking, and that's what Jesus said about salvation, about entering the kingdom of heaven. But much like the Pharisees, we want to know more. Much like the rich young ruler, we want to know, like, what exactly does believing in him mean? I think faith and, and believing in Jesus are probably close to interchangeable. Um, we don't see a lot of a, a specific explanation of what believing in him would be. But in Galatians 2, 4, Paul says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So from verses 5 and 8 there, we know that salvation is a gift, and that grace is a gift of God. And it's given to us through faith, which is also a gift of God. From verse 6 in here, where it says, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. We know that um, not only did God forgive our sins, which would uh, make us not rebellious and not um, fallen creatures, but he also sees us as having righteousness somehow. So Christ's uh, death cancels our sin, and his life, the perfect life that he lived, gives us righteousness. And that's more righteousness than the Pharisees and teachers of the law could, could ever have attained. Again, Paul says in Romans 15, uh, 5.18, Romans 5.18, Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in the condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners. So also through the obedience of the one man, the many were made righteousness. But still, what is faith? James addresses this in James 2.18. Uh, but someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. There's two, two major truths that I see here, and the second, I'm going to do the second part first. Um, the second is verse 19. Knowledge of Jesus is not belief in him. We know that Jesus lived and taught in Israel in the 19, uh, 1920s. I knew I was going to do that. In the, in the <laughs> 20s. And there's no, there's no apostrophe before the 20s. In the, in, around the 20s and 30s, Jesus was teaching and living in Israel. And we know that with the same certainty with, that we know that George Washington was living in Fairfax County, Virginia in the 1700s. I wasn't there. <laughs> you weren't there. None of you were there. I always get this, like, I was looking at the, uh, the date on one of the songs that we sang, and it was 1986, and I was like, man, I was eight years old. I remember, <laughs> I remember, and I was thinking, I was thinking of Elaine, and she, I, in my mind, she just went, oh, you know, <laughs> children. But none of us were alive in the 1700s that I am aware of. And so we uh, base this on 
other people's on what uh, um, other people's eyewitness and on historical evidence, and those things are all in the favor of Jesus having lived and taught in the areas that he said that, that the Bible says that he did. And so knowing that doesn't mean that you believe in Jesus. I mean, I believe in Santa Claus, but that doesn't mean that that doesn't mean he exists, and that doesn't mean really anything that would change my life. I don't believe in Santa Claus. <laughs> um, so Jesus, I think to, to look into, to see what it is, what, what is it that believing in Jesus is. And verse, uh, the beginning of the book of John is, I think, very poetic and I like it. And um, it's not the only place that Jesus was referred to as the word but it's probably the one that I think of. So verses 1 through 5, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, we were talking about, I think it was in Sunday school, right, about people, uh, what percentage was it of people that don't believe? Christians, people who claim to be evangelical Christians who don't believe that Jesus is God. And that pretty much saying it. Um, I don't know I don't know how to make it more clear than that. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So Jesus is God's way of expressing himself to us. He is God's word, and um, we see that each part of the Trinity has different has like a different function. And so, if we, I'm getting ahead of myself, John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So, believing in Jesus is essentially believing what God said. If, if, if uh, Jesus is the word, then everything that he said and everything that he did is from God. It's not, uh, believing in Jesus is just believing what he said. And, and it boils down to trust, because what he said is that he would save us. He didn't exactly say how. I mean, there's books and books and books on how that all works, different theological studies. But what he said is, trust me. The second truth that I see in uh I, I think I changed this multiple times, but it's James 2, 18, I said 19, is that, well, faith does save us, and James never said that it didn't. He, he says that, that it's, uh, a, it reminds me of what Jesus said, um, more, in, a, in sort of a different way, he was saying it more about how the Spirit works in people, in John 3, 8, he says, the wind blows, this is Jesus speaking, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And James is more or less saying the same thing in verse 18 of chapter 2. He's saying you can't see faith in the same way that you can't see the wind. But you can see the effects of the wind. That's how you know it's windy. It's not windy. That, that bush right there isn't moving. So... There's no, there's, there's no effect of it, so it's not happening. And if you don't see the effects of faith, it's not happening. So, uh, well, we, I don't think as a church, believe that we do anything really for our salvation beyond believing in Jesus, which is what he said right there was required. We also believe that if you're not living the way that Jesus told us to live, then your faith is dead. Jesus said that also in, uh, you know, I think I read verse 19 of Matthew 5. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So this isn't necessarily about going to heaven. This is about the status that you'll have in heaven. And that seems to be heavily based on works and about how you live your life. It doesn't save you, but again, 
least in the kingdom of heaven, greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And like I said, the kingdom of heaven is an interesting teaching because it does, Jesus did promise us freedom from slavery to sin, and he promised us eternal life. But he also taught us that on earth, we are the kingdom of heaven. And how we act is supposed to be as an example of the kingdom of heaven. And I hope that as I grow and as you grow, we will be more an example of God's teaching. And we're going to do communion. Is it the same cups, just newer ones? Okay. So, um, if, as everyone probably possibly remembers, as soon as you get the cup, peel that top part off. Because you're going to need, some people are going to need that. <clears throat> and heaven help you if you get the wrong one. No. <laughs> okay. That one went easy. That one went easy. Okay. I'm going to read, I like to read a different sort of, uh, there were a lot of different passages in the Bible, are a lot of different passages in the Bible that refer to communion. And I just like to read a different one every once in a while because I feel like a lot of times we just read, what is it, 1 Corinthians? Yeah. So let's go with the Matthew account of the Last Supper, which is in verse Matthew 26, 26 through 29. And I'm just going to read through this as we're passing out the communion and go ahead and start getting that top piece off. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. I didn't ask anybody to pray, but I can always count on Bonnie, Andy. Father God, thank you. Thank you, thank you. For giving your son, let this little wafer represent all that he gave for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Luke twenty two nineteen says, And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Twenty-two twenty says, Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending your Son. I ask that you would help us to live in the way that he taught us to live, and that we would be an example, and that, like, we're going to see... If it's your will, in the next couple of weeks when I do this devotional again, Peter tells us in his first letter that we have of his, that we should be ready to give an account of the reason for the way that we live. And I ask that you would help us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're going to close our service this morning with page 6. 54. Please stand, page 654.